What is happening, investors? It is your boy, Jack. And on the screen, we have an unfamiliar face. We actually have Brendan Riley on the channel, president and director of Green Power Motors, a company we've spoken about on the channel before, and I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with. But Brendan, thank you very much for taking the time out of what I'm sure is a very busy schedule to come onto the channel. Jack, thank you for having me today. It's going to be awesome. We're going to have fun. So um, I suppose we'll start it off really simply, okay? Just would you like to give the viewers a brief understanding of who Green Power Motors are, the vehicles you offer, and the markets you're in? Just a little backdrop on the company's last few Thank years. Uh, Green Power Motor Company was founded in 2010. Uh, the company went public in 2014 on the TSX. And just this, uh, about a month and a half ago, we went public on the NASDAQ. Uh, Green Power Motor Company uh, develops, designs, delivers, sells, deploys battery electric, zero emission commercial vehicles. Everything from the big double decker, seats 100 passengers, uh, goes uh, 150, 200 miles on, uh, on one charge, to a regular city bus, like a transit bus, yeah. uh, school buses, and then our newest and our flagship product, the EV Star, which is uh, looks like a kind of a super Ford Transit or a super Sprinter type vehicle, all zero emission vehicles, battery electric. Very important. Very important to us on the channel. We like zero emission. We like zero emission a lot. And, um, I suppose that's what I want to find out the most about right now to start. So would you just tell us a little bit more about those different products? So I know the EV Star in particular, I think that's what everybody's going to be the most interested in. From what I can gather, it's the most popular product as of right now. And the Beast, <laughs> aka your buses and the Transit like you know, just a a little bit about why each of those products exist and what, what the main differences are, who the target audience is. So the, uh, you, you've talked about our two focus, real focus products. Um, so these are all uh, vehicles that start with the battery pack and the motor and we design and build the vehicle around it. So neither the Beast, uh, which is our school bus, uh, and, nor the EV Star are converted vehicles. They... Um, the market is filled with companies that actually take an existing vehicle like a Ford Transit or a Sprinter, pull out all the, the motor, drivetrain, all this stuff, and put in batteries and an electric motor and then try to control it. These start life uh, as EVs, and that's one of our key differentiators in both of those markets. Uh, we have the only purpose-built school bus right now in our class, and our type, that isn't a converted bus on some level. Um, are the competitive products in the U.S. for the most part are the same vehicle that you could buy diesel. You could also buy battery electric, and basically all they do is switch the the motors and, and batteries on. So the um, the EV Star is really our. I mean, that's the vehicle we sold the most of, and we've got the most uh, penetration in the market on. And that's a platform. There's actually six vehicles we make out of it. Six uh, different models that we make off of the EV star itself. And uh, if you think about it, it's very similar to what other OEMs do right now with their vehicles. So if you look at a Sprinter or you look at a Ford Transit, there's a number of different variations you can get on that vehicle. That's what we've done with the EV star. Yeah. So uh, the EV star can be a, a, a van to transport people around. It can be an ADA vehicle that you can bring around people that have mobility issues. Uh, we have a cutaway version of it. Basically, it just looks like a pickup truck or a, a cabin chassis that we put a bigger body on um, that is a bigger kind of shuttle bus. And then we can sell that cabin chassis to companies that want to put their wares on it, their body, whatever, on it. And then we've got the cargo variety. Uh, we've got an EV Star Cargo, which is like the cargo vans that you see delivering Amazon and other packages all over the place. And then uh, we have a big box truck with a lift gate on the back that's used for uh, delivering goods, heavier goods. Okay, so uh, so a lot, <laughs> a lot based off of the one kind of vehicle. That's yes. cool. And so I suppose with that, there's a big market to be taken over. There, I mean, there's a lot of different target customers, which is something I know a lot of people are gonna are gonna ask about. So, as of right now, from what I can gather and what you've kind of just said, the EV Star is kind of the star player as such. Would that be fair to say? That's very fair. That's the way we see it. That's the way we see it right now, okay? And so, in regards to the EV Star, then, you just said there's six different kind of models. Who, who are they really being targeted at? Like, who is the target audience? Is it more than, so obviously, you kind of touched on there's last mile livery there, which everybody on this channel is going to be very aware of. Who else is it? 
So that's a really good question. The EV stars are commercial uh, products. We actually do sell the, the, the biggest adopters of the EV stars besides transit properties that use it for micro transit. And I'll, I can explain micro transit to you if you or your audience aren't aware of what that is. But the, the biggest use of the EV stars so to date has been for van pooling here in uh, Southern California. We have a partner called Green Commuter that we sell them to and we work closely with uh, as far as uh, helping you know train operators and so on with the vehicle they're used by regular let's say you worked at a company an hour away and your company sponsored a van pool service our ev star would be an, an option for you to use to drive to and from work every day with your fellow employees okay cool that's awesome yeah a whole lot of people and um, and, and micro transit's another place where we've had a lot of success uh so here, not like in, in Europe where, especially in, in Ireland and the yeah. UK, where you've got very compelling transit models where transit really takes you where you need to go. Here in the US, uh, the, the joke is that transit takes you from where you don't live to where you don't work. <laughs> and that's been the problem with transit in the US. We have these fixed routes. We don't have the urban density, the density of population yes. that you have. And... Um, that's led to a very inefficient kind of uncompelling transit system. Well, Uber comes along. Uber's super exciting. You think of Uber and you think, man, get on my phone. They're going to pick yeah. me up and drop me off exactly where I need to be at about half the price of a regular taxi or yeah. something like that. Uh, so transit properties in the U.S. have been looking at this Uber model and they see it as really something that's eroded their ridership. Okay. So they've lost about... Well, now they've lost a lot more due to COVID, but pre-COVID, they'd lose about 10 to 15% ridership year over year, and they attributed it almost directly to Uber or Lyft. So what transit properties decided is, what if we could make our own Uber for the transit riding public? Kind of the last mile, first mile, last mile transit yeah. service. So they started, uh, they got a, an app that does dispatching of the vehicles and allows customers to hail the vehicle. Okay. They subsidize it heavily, so it's fractional cost of Uber or Lyft. And now people can hail vehicles, uh, EV star included. Uh, they want out this all be zero mission uh, to really pick them up where they're at and drop them off where they're at. And another thing it's allowed them to do is it seems to be taking away from the um, the need for uh, paratransit. So there's also accessibility transit programs here in the U.S. for people that are either elderly or, or disabled call a vehicle up. It's called Dial-A-Ride. Well, they're able to leverage this service to take over that also and give just a very compelling, low-cost, super efficient transit program. Again, it's a small areas, um, and it can feed kind of the bigger transit hubs. But that's... Uh, just about every transit property in the country, in the U.S. at least, has, yeah. uh, has microtransit on their roadmap. Yeah. And our EV star right now is the only eligible EV vehicle that uses federal funds. That's, that's very cool, actually. I don't think that's something I, I didn't really come across, so I doubt many people did. That's very cool. That's kind of like um, creating the solution before a lot of people even knew there was a problem. You know what I mean? Well, it's maybe creating a solution before people realize it's a problem. Uh, yeah. But yeah, you're right. Exactly. That's, that's awesome. That's cool. Okay. So um, as we, you briefly said earlier on, the company recently had their US public offering. So congrats, obviously. Happy days. We're on the NASDAQ. A lot easier for people like myself to buy you guys. I, I was looking at you when we were OTC and I didn't have an option. So I, I missed out a little bit. But anyway, okay. And it was said in that that you intend to use the net proceeds of, in orders for production, product development, and geographic expansion. So I know it yeah. doesn't really go into much more detail than that, but I'm wondering if there's anything you could share with the viewers because people always, you know, we, we want to be looking forward to something, you know? So the, uh, the stated, uh, really what we're spending the lion's share of the, mo uh, of the money that we've raised on is production. So okay. what we want to do is make sure that that money is used, not, uh, you know, we do have great roadmap products that we've been working on even before we receive this money, but production financing is a big, um, so the way it works when you're building EVs or any big capital goods is often you have to, you know, put down payments on things when you start production, 
Uh, you have to buy goods often there. You have to pay, pay for them before you even receive them, uh, especially to get very, very favorable terms. So the, you need capital to build things. And that's what this uplist really has given us this advantage of being able to really make sure we have vehicles built even for inventory. So we've got a dealership model across the country that uh, there's now over 20 different locations of uh, green power uh, sales in the U.S. Uh, locations, plus we have some in Canada. And we can now build vehicles for stock for those locations to have an inventory, just like a car dealer. Like you'd go down to Ford, they usually have the vehicle on the lot. That's, that's, our, um, that's our model right now. That's going to be the biggest thing. That's very cool. Yes. And Make we see that as helping adoption, uh, you know, helping vehicles get also in places where right now we don't know of anybody doing that. Yeah. No, definitely. I think that's going to be an answer that everybody's going to be very happy with as well. I mean, that just says what you can't do much better than that. You know what I mean? So um, I suppose the last year that the company's had, so the last fiscal year ended March 31st, I believe from what I've seen, the annual revenue was 13 and a half million, which was up 122% year over year. So, I mean, I know that people are going to say, well, for one, it doesn't seem like the biggest revenue, like straight off the bat, but for two, it was massive increase year over year. You know what I mean? And a lot of that happened during particularly tough times. And in that period of time, we saw the record 68 all electric vehicles from what I could tell. Okay, so how do we expect the rest of this year to go? And how have the last kind of six months go? Because I mean, I've been seeing much bigger sales numbers on, on the website when we look into the news tabs. So I'm wondering what's expected, say, for Green Pro over the next six months in regards to actual sales? So we, we aren't giving guidance right now. Okay. Um, I can just tell you it's, it's greater than um, and than what we've seen. We just don't know if COVID's going to be in. And for us, sales isn't just selling the vehicle or getting the order. We're talking about delivering it to the customer. One of the challenges we've had you know, with this COVID is no one's at work to receive vehicles. So you can't recognize revenue. And it, it really is delivering and having the customer accept the vehicle. That's part of the, the model. So I think until you know we're through this period where we know we're not going to get a second wave or what have you, uh, we're just trying to be as cautious as possible to, and not give guidance to the market. But uh, we do have, uh, we have a lot of vehicles to be delivered still. We're in production with uh, over 60 vehicles right now uh, that are actually in some stages of production. So that might give you an idea of how many vehicles we anticipate delivering over the next couple months. Definitely. Fantastic. And yeah, I think everybody's going to think that's very fair. I mean, it's unforeseen circumstances for literally everybody. I think everybody's had to adapt massively. But um, yeah, from what we can see and from what you've just said, I think everybody's going to say that things look good. Um, in regards to Green Commuter, you, you briefly touched off them earlier on. Um, from what I can gather, at least they seem to be you know, your, your biggest customer at the moment or the company you're working with the most. So how do we plan on getting more of these long-term contracts going forwards? You know, so that when everything so, does go back to normal, we can really push on. Yeah, that's a really good question. The um, Green Commuter is the largest EV fleet in the country for van pooling, ride sharing, and vehicle leasing. Okay. Uh, they're located here in California, and Gustavo Acuso, who's the, uh, the, the CEO of the company, is a, a very interesting personality. You know, uh, it's a very driven by uh you know a strong leader and a visionary okay you'll see i'm, I'm starting to see more people uh more companies and often it is a personality driven but more companies like that that have this vision yeah. and that are really starting to address this market yeah uh, i can't talk to, about any specific right now but we are in communication with one in chicago there's uh, some on the east coast uh, people are looking to expand both, you know, carpooling, van pooling, and really leverage EV fleets in general. Uh, it's a, uh, it is a fairly nascent market and, uh, you know, green commuters figured out a way to be profitable, to expand it, to grow it, to really garner most of the contracts. And, Cause remember here in, in California, uh, van pooling is paid for by two sources typically a local transit property or a local government and then subsidized by the company that has his employees 
and it's actually cost effective, you know, from any perspective. And with our EV van pools, it costs less than the drivers actually driving to, to and from work. So you're going to see that take off. One of the hiccups in van pooling has been people aren't working at work anymore. Uh, and that's been the case in California. A lot of people are working remotely. So I don't know that van pooling is going to necessarily grow at the rate it was growing uh, you know, last year, but it's, um, it's coming back. I mean, uh, we are going to have to go back to work at some point. People do need to work together to collaborate. Uh, and van pooling is a, is a, is a great uh, concept and we expect that to be. So other types of fleets, so we are also the only vehicle that's been federally tested Yes. and has Buy America compliance for the transit fleets. So we expect large orders from transit properties. We've recently become eligible for transit properties to buy off of a contract. Um, this is just announced recently called Cal Act here in California. Uh, it's also can sell into other states that are able to buy off of Cal Act. And um, this program allows people to buy an EV star without going out to RFP. And are you familiar with an RFP process? So you RFP, pro, there's procurement guidelines for transit properties that are very complex. And, it's going to save uh, everybody a whole lot of time. Exactly. And money. Uh, and some properties are small. They want EVs. So our, my concept with the EV star is this. I was into the big buses. We built this big 100 seated passenger, 27 standy double decker. <laughs> And I thought, wow, you know, this is really compelling. The, beast. the problem was no one had enough power to charge the darn thing. So you got this big vehicle. It's got a, over a half a megawatt hour battery on board, you know, <laughs> yeah. basically a power plant on board. <laughs> and no one had like the power to charge more than one of these. So yes. one vehicle in a fleet doesn't really do much. <laughs> so recalibrating and thinking uh, about the market, and this is a number of years ago, I really didn't see any place uh, that was producing any company that was producing the smaller vehicle with maybe a, a large Tesla size battery that, you know, met a certain range that would allow people to get exposed to uh, battery electrics. So we developed, we spent years developing a vehicle that met all these requirements, had the capacity that you can't get by converting a vehicle. So we had to build a kind of a heavier duty vehicle because batteries are heavy and everything to be able to be meaningful. We had to put enough batteries on board for the range that these guys needed. We need to make sure it charged with all the standard charging uh, equipment that people may even have at home, that type of stuff. Yeah. We also needed it to be able to be fast charged. We needed it to be wirelessly charged so you can use some of the wireless charging technology. And then um, we also designed a vehicle that was uh, ready for autonomy. Uh, had uh, the space claims for the autonomous stack and all these other things. So we, we developed the vehicle kind of ahead of the game to, to meet uh, even, I don't want to say unforeseen, but not maybe yet realized um, things in, 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 the, in the space. Yeah. And that's what led us to the EV star. So a fleet can buy 10 EV stars and it's like running, you know, two, big transit buses okay. as far as charging infrastructure. It's easy to drive. You can hop in and drive an EV star. As a matter of fact, when you're in Los Angeles, I'll have an EV star for you to drive. <laughs> yeah, I'll be there. I'll be there. But um, the, the long and the short of the spaces, there has been, and, and also we expanded our, our procurement. Uh, we focused on making sure we're buying the components properly, the, the traction motor the cells, the batteries, having those built in a way that is scalable and, and cost effective. The other thing we've done is uh, kind of the way Apple, I've been a fan of how contract manufacturing can really allow a company to be more nimble, to limit their, their you know, overall cost of doing business, yeah. to uh, you're, you're, you're paying for things as you go, which I really like that. I love the kind of buy as you go, pay as you go type so we've got manufacturing assembly in Malaysia, which is superb. Have you, do you know much about Malaysia? Can't say I do. <laughs> small, small country, Southeast Asia, uh, just underneath Thailand there. And that is amazing. They've got four car manufacturers in Malaysia for 
you know, 20 million people. It's, it's crazy how yeah. automotive the culture is. And, uh, you know, Dyson builds their products there. Uh, early on in semiconductor, everybody built stuff either in Malaysia, Singapore, they're kind of touch, touching each other. Super high quality, uh, fascinating place. We have assembly in Malaysia that we oversee. So we can have build exactly our same vehicle that we build here in the US in Malaysia for substantially less money yes. and at higher volumes. And if we don't require the Buy America compliance, we get a very high quality uh, vehicle at a lower cost, uh, which is also getting lower and lower as our uh, volumes increase, that no one in the US has, has, uh, has looked at. So people have been looking at you know, talking about their range or talking about one component from us, it's got to be a global effort. We have to look at, you know, this is this vehicle itself is a business proposition. It has to be inexpensive to manufacture, uh, compelling to the customer, uh, has to be reliable, has to have all these different attributes that you need to be a successful vehicle. We're not just saying we can go the farthest, you know, <laughs> yeah. we're the prettiest, we're the lightest, I, yeah. any of that stuff. It's kind of the, the blend of those things. And that's really where I think the EV star, uh, I mean, that's the culmination of my vision at least. Yeah. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's it's the whole, just everything coming together absolutely perfectly. You know what I mean? Making that EV star, making it what it is. That's exactly. awesome. That's absolutely awesome. Yeah, cool. Um, that's sick. Yeah, we got a lot of information there. That's awesome. Okay, cool. I'm going to have to watch that part back myself like two or three times. <laughs> but um, I suppose the next thing is, I think at this stage we all know that the EV market has been growing quickly for a long time but i genuinely think the last couple of years in particular it's been going a little bit crazy so i mean as more competitors hit the market what sets you apart is, is it everything that we've just spoken about i mean what is what are you guys offering that's going to lead to this long-term growth that i mean all of us investors want you know jack that's a great question so a lot of people try to look at say okay what is that one thing that makes these guys that gives them the edge on all their competitors and I've been in this space. I was uh, employee number one of BYD Motors in the U.S. So I've been in this space for a good long time. And I have not, you know, 10 years ago, the technology was already advanced. You get into a, a 2011 Tesla Model S, 2012 Tesla Model S, and you, you drive that vehicle, it's as good today as the Model S coming off the line. Okay. You know, they may have increased energy density in the battery, power densities in the batteries, but for the most part, the technology has not really advanced much more. And there's been some minor refinements. So my position is we've got IP and battery management systems and all this stuff, but it's very small and incremental. The real compelling nature is the vehicle design itself. So when I look at like a Tesla compared to a Bolt, there's no comparison from my perspective between those two vehicles. The Tesla is just a completely different driving experience. Yeah. That is uh, where we're looking at, you know, okay. yes, you know, you can have battery days and yes, people need to focus on various things, but there is no real serious advantage um, that I can look at besides the compelling nature of the vehicle. So right now um, look at what, Mercedes is doing with their uh, their e sprinter, I think they call it, or Ford's trying to do with their e transit. They're taking an existing vehicle, removing the motors and uh, exhaust system and fuel tank, and electrifying it. So they're taking a vehicle that was designed as an internal combustion vehicle, pulling off all this stuff, putting in motors in it, uh, batteries in it, which weigh a lot more than what they pulled out. <laughs> yeah. And they're either sacrificing range. So the East Sprinter, last I heard, they get between 50 and 60 miles on a charge. Yeah. And that might work in Dublin, you know. <laughs> you're just uh, yeah. That's not so even going to work over here. That's not even I don't know. But I don't think it really is, 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 is that compelling. Or if you put enough batteries in, you're not delivering anything because you've used up your capacity <laughs> to bring batteries on. So the there has to be a balance and remember it's not as it stands right now batteries are about 14 percent the energy density of fuel so if you look at the weight you're carrying and all that stuff you really have trade-offs batteries just don't have 
you know, and wireless charging helps and fast charging helps and so on and so forth to get you through your day. But the, the whole concept that, you know, Nicola and all these people are talking about battery electric, big rig trucks for long haul. Yeah. You're either moving batteries or you're moving goods. You can't really move both. Okay. And we understand that. And we're not promising, you know, a complete replacement for these vehicles. We're just using the best case model that we can to produce a compelling vehicle. And that, my competitors haven't seemed to have figured that out. That's yeah. my position. And uh, will yeah. they? Yes. Uh, but hopefully, you know, our first to market advantage, first yes. mover advantage is there. Uh, we've already got hundreds and hundreds of thousands of miles on our vehicles that we just started delivering last year. Yeah. And um, we expect to continue to improve. Another thing we need to do as green power that we've been focused on, like a laser, is lowering the cost on the vehicle. Okay. You know, the target is to make a compelling vehicle in our space that only is 20 or 30% more expensive yeah. than the internal combustion vehicle it's replacing. Awesome. And if you look at operational savings and, you know, fuel yeah. economy, not including any of that stuff, from day one, you'll okay. be printing money. And even today, if you finance a vehicle, from day one, you're saving money with our EV stock. So, because yes. you blend the OPEX and the CAPEX, and we're way ahead of the game. That's fantastic. I think that's what everybody wants to have. You know, it, it was built from the ground up to be an electric vehicle. You know, it's not just a nice vehicle turned electric. We want to be as cost effective and, you know, save people as much money as possible. That's one of the big reasons people go to EV. You know what I mean? There's no so, trade off. I've, I've got an anecdote for you. We, um, we tested our vehicle uh, at an independent uh, test track that's actually independent to us. That's run by the U.S. government, or at least subsidized by the government. It's called Altoona. It's in Pennsylvania. Yes. It's in the small town, not far from Penn State. And it's a proving ground. It's a track that has, it's kind of an obstacle course for vehicles. Yeah. Potholes and it's very similar to your roads. And <laughs> yeah. our vehicle uh, simulated its entire lifetime on this track, had zero issues, ran in the winter, uh, you know, with a driver that fast charged every day, uh, had zero issues with the battery traction motor, had some minor, uh, you know, service things that had to be done that all the vehicles have to go. Yeah. We got the highest score of any vehicle ever tested for a medium or heavy duty vehicle. And they allot 150 hours for service on these vehicles. We use 15 of those hours for the whole uh, test. So uh, we also did it getting an average of 50 miles to the gallon equivalent. So it's a, uh, there's, EVs, all of us know, all your listeners here know that they are taking over. They are the future, absolutely necessary for, uh, you know, for the growth of our industry and for lowering costs, keeping our environment, you know, all those things. Yep. Uh, the market's big enough for more than all of us. Yep. There's more than enough space for additional companies to get in and succeed. And, you know, I'm not je so jealous of my space thinking that, you know, I don't want Mercedes to come out with yes. compelling products. Okay. Ford to come out. I want them to come out with super compelling products yeah. because they say the high tide lifts all ships. Yeah. I totally believe that in the EV space. We need more successes. We need more Teslas. Uh, we need more green powers. We need yeah. more Nissans. We need more people building and delivering products. That's awesome. It's going to be good for absolutely everybody, 100%. And I love that. And the fact that we already have that first mover advantage as well, it just, it just puts us nicely there for growth. Um, I suppose one more real question we'd have that people always like me to ask in these style of interviews is, what do we see as the main challenges in the future in regards to growth? You know what I mean? So obviously we've just spoken, everything's amazing. You know, it all sounds beautiful. But if you had to choose one thing that we think is going to be a challenge going forwards, what would that be? And how do we plan on, you know, overcoming that? So there's several challenges, um, uh, but the main challenges for us right now that I see are one, being able to make enough batteries for all these vehicles. So okay. I've got multiple different technologies that we're leveraging for our batteries. We use iron phosphate, we use NMC. Uh, we've got the different chemistries um, that are made in different parts of the world. So you don't have, you know, these supply chain interruptions. Okay. Uh, similar to what Tesla's doing. They run NMC on their Model 3 here in the U.S. In China, the Model 3 runs iron phosphate. Okay. So 
uh, I had no, we, we actually started doing this before Tesla did. So uh, maybe Elon's listening in on my call. <laughs> he's watching, he's watching the interview. But um, that's, a, that's a big challenge because batteries, if you look at our capacity to build batteries and some of the rare earth materials that go in some of these batteries, even uh, electric motors, you know, with neodymium, some rare earth magnets for the high energy and power density of these motors, uh, that could be an issue. So um, supply chain can be an issue. Uh, the other issue is just not having the infrastructure. That's been my issue from day one, is not having enough charging infrastructure to take advantage, to, to, to really supply yes. the demand. And that's something that you see China's done a very good job. I mean, they drop chargers like they're, you know, like, yeah. like weeds. They're everywhere. And Europe is starting to do that. Here in California, we're really doing it. Um, yeah. We've got Electrify America, who's building a super highway of chargers. Yeah. And by the way, our vehicles are designed to leverage, all of our vehicles are designed to leverage that existing charging uh, technology. So we use regular uh, garden variety chargers, both level two and DC fast chargers. Perfect. And of course the wireless chargers, which are a different conversation. Yep. So the, the issue is going to be, we're not going to right size the charging to the amount of vehicles on the road. And there's going to be some bumps and starts. Okay. Fleets are a very smart way to look at things. And that's kind of what we're looking at because they'll often have their own charging yep. and control their own charging. But eventually for EV adoption, we need to make sure that chargers are more ubiquitous and that we have enough electrical power, um, you know, in the grid that's transmitted, produced and transmitted to where it needs to be for charging. Yeah, that's awesome. That makes a lot of sense. And again, that's, I suppose, somewhat of a, of a universal problem as of right now. You know what I mean? It's, that's, that's something that's just going to have to handle one step at a time. But yeah, but I'll say I'll say to you, it's the beauty of, you know, what is the the fuel of an EV? It's an electron. Electrons yeah. are electrons. Power is power. So very soon, you know, if you like, if I've got a Tesla, I can plug it into a level two adapt a charger with an adapter, um, and I can use for my level two vehicle an adapter for a Tesla charger. Yeah. So we're starting to get more, you know, cross pollinated with the different protocols and charging standards and strategies. And that's helpful. But, you know, the other beauty is people don't have to go to the fuel station anymore. Yes. You can, you can fill your, your, your plug becomes your fuel station. Yeah. That's, that saves you a lot of time, a lot of headache. And especially women, my wife, I don't know if she's ever filled up a car in her life. I, <laughs> she gives me the car. She goes, Oh, it's empty. You got to fill it up. I mean, it's something. So I see women adopting EVs probably uh, more than men for that reason alone. Okay. That's interesting. That's very interesting. Um, Brendan, that's pretty much what I had to ask, but is there anything you think that should, should be shared with everybody watching this right now that didn't come up in today's video? So we, we're doing something really exciting uh, okay. at Green Power. We're, uh, <laughs> besides what I've been talking about, that's pretty exciting. Really exciting. We're uh, deploying our first fully autonomous level five autonomous vehicle in passenger service on regular streets in the city of Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, by the end of this year, the vehicle's built, it's validated. We're just waiting to get it integrated into the fleet and get started. But it's, um, Is you that might a have a safety bag? pilot or a safety driver in the front, but all he's got is like a button <laughs> to like <laughs> stop. I mean, you, the controls are still there, but, uh, yeah. he's got a button to stop and then take over if he needs. But, um, okay. Economist is very cool. And, um, we're going to be the only autonomous platform that, can be integrated at manufacture of the vehicle. So we're not you know, taking things apart to retrofit, to automate. Uh, our partner right now on that deployment is called Perone Robotics. They make what's called a stack. That's all the computer hardware and software that actually takes the information from sensors and then controls the vehicle. So the vehicle, and it's not just like what you've probably seen are these glorified golf carts that go eight or 10 miles an hour and just <laughs> in a line. This is actually in the streets, looking at street lights, cool. pedestrian traffic, car traffic, while taking customers, oh, yeah. transit customers around. So Ooh. we're, we're excited about that. And that coupled with wireless trans, uh, wireless charging. Yes. And are you familiar with wireless charging? Yeah. Uh, so for those that aren't, 
uh, wireless charging is like your iPhone. When you set it on something, at, uh, like a pad, it'll, it'll charge wirelessly. You don't have to touch anything. So vehicles can do that. There's uh, a couple companies. The company we're partnered with right now on our current, uh, and there's, there's other companies out there, but we're using Momentum Dynamics, which um, is also uh, looking to penetrate the European market. Uh, the, the premise is to have a charging pad on the ground yeah. in the asphalt, wherever the vehicle just drives over it. Doesn't have to do anything. Just drives over the pad and it can charge over about a eight to 10 inch air gap. So nothing has to be touched and you're about 95% efficiency. So just about where very close to where plug in conductive charging okay. is. Um, and that allows, you know, no one's going to forget to charge the vehicle. Yeah. A driver can just drive over a place where they're stopping to eat lunch, go to the bathroom, wait for customer. And you could charge vehicles while people are loading and offloading. So for the autonomous space, we've got wireless charging hands off. Uh, we're uh, integrating a full autonomous control package and stack into our vehicle with sensors, servos, all those things to control the vehicle. And then I see um, a really fascinating uh, possibility of doing delivery utilizing that uh, okay. technology where grocery store, what have you, the vehicles are just loaded up and they go in a neighborhood and just yeah. come to your house, stop in front of your house, you click your, your iPhone or whatever you got, you go and open up your little compartment, pull out your goods and yeah. off it goes delivery. Because right now, uh, deliveries here in the U.S., uh, and we got a lot of it, uh, they charge about 10, 15 bucks just to deliver something. And if you can build a vehicle big enough uh, that has enough space, you're printing money with yeah. autonomous delivery. Plus, you don't have interaction with people, no kind of touchy COVID stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, a, it's a fully... Uh, so we really see some big possibilities in that space and, uh, our EV star cargo and our EV star CC, which we use for goods transport. That's going to be a exciting, uh, I think step. I like that a lot. Yeah. Cause that's actually using autonomy for more than just being able to sit back and let the car do the work, you know? And that's what so many people think of. I mean, it, something like that makes so much sense and it's going to be so efficient for every single person involved that that's awesome yeah, and also, that's coming out if you look at the delivery space too like amazon's a little different because they run around and they walk around this stuff but you look at most truck driving positions and it is one unhealthy job you're just sitting in your seat typically breathing in fumes yeah. but you're just sitting in your seat all day it's not the the we're not designed for that we're designed to be a little more mobile um yeah so i also see it as a as a great and, if you look at it from the transit perspective, all these drivers are like, what's going to happen to the driver? Well, you, you, the driver doesn't have to sit in the seat anymore. We can have him as a person that helps people on board, you know, make sure things don't get out of hand. Almost more like a flight attendant than a driver. There's, okay. you know, if, if you look at things in a static world where, you know, this job might just go away, I don't see the job going away. I see the job evolving into a more meaningful, compelling, interesting job that provides even a better level of service. I like that. I think that's excellent. You know, it's, it's, it's streamlining things that are very easy to do and then allowing the actual human to do things that, you know, will just make it an even better experience for everybody involved. Yet again, you know, it doesn't negatively impact anybody. Exactly. Yeah, no, that, that's awesome. And people are going to love that. I mean, every, every, for whatever reason, everybody loves autonomy. You know what I mean? Especially when we get into the level five, uh, you know, somehow your, your, your car just coming up outside your door and dropping you off. You know, if you want some late night pop tarts or something, people are going to enjoy that. Like, but yeah, that, and that makes a lot of sense as well for then bigger fleets to be getting involved, big retailers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's awesome. Yes. That's yeah. very cool, Brendan. Well, um, I really appreciate you coming on. That was excellent. I think people got a, a whole lot of, as we say on this channel, juicy information out of that interview. I'm looking forward to watching it back myself. I'm always trying to say concentrate, but then I have to think of the next question. But um, thank you so much for coming on, Brendan. Really do appreciate that. Jack, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. We'll see you soon, Brennan. Have a great day. Hey.